Hello everybody, welcome to this Bank Holiday Monday edition of the Front Page, the Racing Post news and analysis programme. You join us after another busy week on the story front and joining me to discuss the stories this week, we have in the studio, Mr Chris Cook, you well sir? Yeah, well we. Busy week gone? Uh, very, yeah, very busy. Um, all sorts happening. Yeah, including one very long day um, listening into a disciplinary hearing. So that was fun. Some of you, you know, I love one of those. You do. You, uh, uh, as much as racing politics. Well, more. Even more than racing politics. That yeah. tells you how much he loves it. And joining us for the first time remotely uh, from his home in Paris is our French correspondent, Monsieur Scott Burton. Hello, Scott. Hi there, Lee. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Mate. How's uh, How's Paris today? Very good, very good. We're all obviously uh, very excited about the news of a potential star coming here for the art. So, um, uh, and I love the art almost as much as Chris loves disciplinary hearings. So, and we shall be talking about um, Bayid and the arc at the end of the program. We did him in a, in a big lump last week, but with that story's moved on, so we'll be visiting Bayid at the end of the show. Uh, my two co-conspirators this week are in the very peak of condition, so they won't appreciate Steady. that when a person is trying to lose a bit of weight, there are occasions when that person approaches the scales with bleak resignation, knowing that after a bit too much wine or maybe a frangipan tart, the number on the screen will be broadly the same as the time before. Waiting for the British 2023 fixture list was much like that. <laughs> what, one wonders, will come first? The unveiling of the 2024 fixture list or the final result of the 2022 Norfolk States? We'll be looking at that and we'll also be discussing Epsom's loss of Kazoo as the Derby sponsor when that partnership was first unveiled only 16 months ago. I thought the Derby was set to be sponsored by a strawberry milkshake. That wasn't the case, but in a difficult sponsorship market, it might be one avenue for the Jockey Club to examine. OK then, well, the big story that really ran through the whole of last week and will continue to run is the 2023 fixture list and then what comes up after that tied in with the British Racing's uh, strategy discussions and presenting that as his story for front page consideration is Scott Burton. Over to you, Scott. Yes, indeed. Uh, no real surprises in terms of the way that the, uh, the fixed list was, was unveiled, only the amount of time it took for it to arrive. 1,478 uh, fixtures next year, only four fewer than, than this year in 2022. Uh, and plenty of people with an opinion on it. Uh, Rafe Beckett, Mark Johnson, a lot of the trainers getting very much, very aerated and involved. Uh, I think we've seen uh, people at the BHA also uh, batting hard for, for the idea that there was going to be no significant change this year after that proposal of, of dropping 300 races uh, was mixed in the executive meeting. Um, it's, uh, it's a case of waiting and waiting and waiting some more, really, isn't it? Because... Uh, we're all waiting for these two days of, of strategy talks. And uh, you talk about frangipan tarts and, and diets and all the rest of it. It reminds me very much of one of those diet plans where you have a plate of food and you have to eat your vegetables first and then your protein and then finally your carbohydrates. We have to have the strategy. Then we have to have the uh, working out of the, the management structure. And then only at that point do we get to, to really get into the nuts and bolts of how to fix British racing, and it's a frustrating wait. I'm loving the fact that our um, our first Paris contribution brings in a metaphor, as well as a food-based metaphor. Um, Chris, we didn't expect anything different, did we, from the fictionist? Not really, no. I mean, the, realistically, there was no way it was going to be anything but this. But, you know, it, I can remember this happening for years. Um, you know, the fixture list would just drop on us suddenly at a different time each year, it seems, um, which is another reason why horse racing doesn't seem as organised as it should. You know, other sports get to know when their fixture list yeah. is coming. It's the same time every year. But anyway, ours just sort of happens. Um, uh, and yeah, it's, it's the same every year, isn't it? It's, 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 even though there's been concern for quite a long time about um, too much racing, uh, you know, that's the generally accepted view these days. Um, every year it comes out and there's, you know, even a few more than the year before. 
um, and all of those concerns are never reflected in the in the eventual outcome. Um, but we've we've agreed already, haven't we, as a sport, that we've got to hammer out the strategy before we can take um, significant action. Um, so that's what's going to happen in these strategy meetings next month on the 19th and 20th, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and and it, you know, so much hangs on that. If uh, if they can agree a way forward and and then agree sacrifices that, that are going to have to be made for the general good, um, then the fixture list for the year after next will hopefully reflect the, the changes that need to be made. Um, but you know, it's it's going to have to be a real break with all the form in the book in terms of how racing as an industry behaves. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the interesting things um, I find about this process going forward is the divisions maybe within groups as well as between groups. Um, we, we sort of learned a bit last week about what the BHA actually wants to do because Richard Wayman was quoted saying he, he spoke of a vision of a of a pruned fixture list going forward, which I think would be, uh, if we're talking about a reduced fixture list, that would certainly be in, in line with what some stakeholders believe. But if you look within uh, thoroughbred group members, you have got the NTF with a very strong position, with, with Rafe Beckett, its president, uh, talking last week of the RCA as being an immovable object yep. to change and very clearly wanting a reduction in overall fixture and race numbers. You've got the ROA, which you could argue almost at the moment seems more closely aligned to the arena racing company than to the National Trainers Federation, which is interesting given it's trainers who receive their, their income from, from owners, yet they're, they're not in any way aligned on this one, it seems. And then what you've got within the race courses, you have ARC, who, who clearly fought hard against that plan to reduce the 23, 2023 fixture list by, by mm. 300 races. You've got the RCA, who I thought David Armstrong, the chief executive, in his words last week, he was leading us more towards a vision of not so much changing numbers of fixtures, but changing the races within those fixtures. But you also had Bill Farnsworth from Musselburgh saying that he really did want a reduced number of fixtures, and he thought the BHA needed to be empowered to overrule race courses because race courses were, were, were biased in their approach. Because not surprisingly, race courses would often be reluctant to reduce fixtures because as, as, as we've said before yeah. no fixture generally loses money they all they all they all make money they're for the sport levy but positive they're all levy positive but equally you could add uh, you could add scott a class five handicap to every day at royal ascot and that would that would make money but it wouldn't be a good thing and we we Presumably, don't we have to look at the bigger picture and we have to say, do we want British racing to look like a, a bargain basement superstore or more akin to a John Lewis? I thought it was very, very interesting listening to um, uh, Adam Waterworth at, at Goodwood. I know you spoke to him uh, yeah. on Saturday. I thought he made some really interesting points about the fact that the, the kind of, if you like, the Premier League of, of, of tracks, the, the elite tracks, are going to, to take say, for instance, these rises in, in minimum race values, they will always seek to be X number of percent above that. And therefore, kind of a, a rising tide floats all boats in terms of prize money from that direction. But he was talking about a race like the March Stakes and saying, well, you know, we spent £100,000 on it this year. It'll be 125 next year or whatever. We are going to spend that money on that race. But is it the right race? Should it be a... a naught to 95 handicap or something like that i think it's really interesting when you hear those those kind of like the 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 big independents speak obviously we know that the uh, arena racing have their position we know that jockey club race courses have a, a a slightly different position um but they're obviously both uh in in art's case beholden to their shareholders in in uh the jockey club's case they're obviously trying to look after all the constituent race courses and also the training facilities and everything else. They, they feed their money back into racing one way or another. So um, it's very interesting to listen to these big independents, William Darby speaking from, from Yorkshire as well, uh, from, from York race course as well, to see that they're in some senses, they're trying to, to, to lead a slightly different message to the one that, that David Armstrong from the RCA is, is, is they're not necessarily uh, in, in any way, um, talking against what he's talking but they're adding extra extra flesh on the bone extra ideas that can be can be kicked around in this strategy meeting i think it's very interesting when you get 
uh, any kind of stakeholders who were talking against their short-term interest. Um, I think if you listen to, to the, the views of, of Ray Beckett or Mark Johnson or, or any of the other, maybe some of the less vocal trainers who we don't hear from so often who's, who have felt moved by this now, um, I mean, I, I spoke to a, a syndicate uh, manager a few weeks ago who was very clear that his uh, syndicate members are actually doing very well out of small fields at the moment, that they are they probably won uh, four or five more races this year than they would have done in a normal year because they've, they've rocked up in very small, uncompetitive fields in, in, in the middle of the week. But he said he would much rather be racing for fewer but bigger pots he wants to run his horses in more hundred thousand pound handicaps so um if when you get a situation like that or or uh, a trainer like rafe or, or, or like mark who knows that a prune fixture list means fewer winning opportunities and that obviously in a in a competitive environment where uh owners may say well that's that's not so great because we want to go and win races that that pruning of the fixture list, which would enable people to race for better money and hopefully keep these better horses, the kind of uh, 90 to 110 rated horses that British racing has so much difficulty in retaining. I think when you get people like that arguing outside of the the, um, uh, the kind of mainstream message of each each group that you're talking about, the, the, the thoroughbred group and the, the race course association, then you get a chance for some advance um, and I think my, the, my final point I would make on it is just that um, Julie Harrington obviously had the, the opportunity, the BHA had the opportunity in that executive uh, meeting in, in June to actually lose those 300 races. And she strikes me as somebody who very, very much wants consensus. I think if there's anything that the BHA will be hoping for out of these two days of strategy talks is to get everybody rowing in the same direction. Now, whether that can be achieved is another matter. But she doesn't. It doesn't look to me like they're looking to to use their tie-breaking powers uh, in the kind of tripartite um, uh, agreement. They want all three parties to to come up with something that they think they can stick with. Whether that can be done, I don't know. And even if it can be done, whether then people will stick with it down the road is another matter. But that, to me, clearly seems to be the BHA strategy. Yeah, I mean, Julie Harrington's been very clear about about that. She. Um about the need to govern by consensus. Yeah. She, she wants to respond to what racing is telling her. And, you know, she doesn't, she's just not going to be that kind of autocrat, which I sense some people are sort of harking back to, you know, the old Savile days where um, you'd get a you know, powerful person in charge. You would say, this is where we're going. Um, you know, that's not her style. And that's, I think she was picked you know, specifically because she wasn't going to be the, that, the person who would make decisions that sectors might not like. But what's interesting is that some stakeholders, and we heard from Bill Farnsworth last week, actually want Julie Harrington, the BHA, well, to be like that. They want them to say, yeah. no, we're not going to listen to you because we, as if you like the impartial organisation in this, believe this is the right direction for they the want, They want the firm smack of strong government, yeah. which of course is the thing that you hark back to when you don't have it, and then it comes around and you think, actually, this isn't all that much fun after all. Um, but, but I mean, we just, we haven't ever agreed on um, our philosophies as a sport in terms of what we want, and, and that shows up in some of the discussions we're having. I mean, so Paul Nichols turned up on Sky Sports Racing on Sunday, um, saying he thinks, you know, ideally, uh, there would be a two-month break from jump racing yeah. in the summer. Um, and he, he recognises that's controversial. It's not going to suit everybody, um, you know. But that's his instinct, um, and you can see the argument for it because you know the hope would be that the remaining fixtures that happen in the summer yeah. would be strengthened. Um, but Fergal O'Brien um, and Graham McPherson, they have the joint Twitter account. They responded, you know, with quite a long thread yeah, last night that. explaining why they saw things very differently. You know, they say usually we agree with Paul, but on this occasion not for these reasons. Mm. A two-month gap in the middle of the jump year for them would be a, a devastating blow to their business model and not just theirs you know there's other trainers like them um, and entire race courses who you know depend on summer jump racing it's conceivable that the sport might collectively agree you know okay we want to move away from that to some extent um, and but you'd have to manage that carefully over time um, to sort of to soften the pain for the people who are definitely going to suffer pain um, we just we've got to establish some principles what we do what do we actually want the sport to look like in five ten fifteen years time and and you know hopefully the, the good that will come from this whole process is that um, we'll we'll have a sport that's been you know sculpted if you like um, and managed and not just allowed to kind of grow organically and chaotically you know we'll, we'll have something that we've decided 
um, to, to nurture as a sport um, in an organised fashion. Um, I, I think that would be preferable. Just quickly, Scott, this, the, the debates that we've been having in, in British racing recently about field sizes, about attendances, about fixture numbers, does, does French racing have that same sort of debate? Or are they looking at us uh, a bit like Macron would look at Liz Truss and say, what on earth are they talking about? I don't think there's quite so much epic eye rolling as President Macron uh, managed to the other day. Uh, there are similar, there are echoes of it in the way that French racing is run, because the major difference here is that it is a very centralised system and you can respond to the fluctuating nature of your horse population very, very easily. If you could, if you want to lose 10 fixtures here or add 10 fixtures here or trim a certain section of the, the, the programme book and expand another programme, you can do it very, very easily. The, the race courses. The, the main race courses in Paris and, and Deville and Dan in Poe are actually owned by France Gallo and everything else is on a license to, to, to those courses and they basically get what they're given. So it's a very much more centralised system. That's not to say that there aren't a lot of um, uh, issues swirling around that are connected in terms of attendances, in terms of uh, there's a lot of uh, gnashing of teeth about the uh, competitiveness of uh French trainers, we've just been through a month at Deauville when British and Irish trainers have won all the Group 1 races and a fair chunk of the the um, the, the, the lesser pattern races as well. Uh, you could argue that that maybe some of the better French horses stayed in their boxes or didn't run in the top races, and uh, and that's an issue there. So there are, there are other issues swirling around, but I think that the sort of centralised nature of of French racing and also the centralised nature of the funding, the, the fact that it all comes through through the the, the uh, Paris Mutual uh, tote, just means that there are more levers that can be pulled. And I think there's probably quite a deal of sympathy uh, in the upper echelons of France Gallo with their, their confrere um, at the BHA because there isn't that, that power uh, there. And what power there is, there seems to be a slight reluctance to use it. Yeah, and using power is going to be crucial over the coming weeks. September 19th is the date when those strategy talks begin. Not too much longer to wait now. OK, my story is concerning the Derby, what has been the Kazoo Derby and the Kazoo Oaks over the last two years, but it won't be any longer. Anyone who's read the financial pages will know that Kazoo, the, uh, the online car retailer, has not been having a very happy time with redundancies, plummeting market values, restructuring of the business. So it wasn't a great surprise that it was announced last week, or we revealed last week, that Kazoo will no longer be sponsoring the Derby and the Oaks. Uh, we have got the Kazoo Ledger, Kazoo Ledger, coming up at Doncaster. When I asked uh, the Arena Racing Company whether that would extend into next year, they declined to comment. So I think we know what the likely answer is about that one. And again, no surprise there. I think in both instances, with the Derby and the Oaks and the St Ledger, I don't think Kazoo's announcement was a... Um, an indication that the Derby or the St Ledger have done anything wrong. I think it's one of those, you know, you have break up discussions. It, it's, not, it's not you, it's me. I think it very much is a kazoo thing as opposed to a racing thing on this one. But it is an interesting situation. It took uh, the Jockey Club eight months to find a successor for Investec when they walked away from the Derby. And Kazoo was announced with a, as a multi year deal partnership. But we've learned since then, speaking to people last week, that. Kazoo's partnership from Kazoo's and anyway was only ever supposed to be a short-term arrangement. It was also an arrangement in which Kazoo, unlike some other big race sponsors, has never really activated that sponsorship, by which we mean they've never really done anything to promote the race outside of the sponsorship itself. You have some backers like John Smith in the old days with the Grand National. Yeah. or Boodles or, or Randox, they actually do physically try and make the most of their sponsorship by using it to really promote their brand. Kazoo never did that. So if we're in a situation where it took the Jockey Club eight months to find a sponsor who wanted a short-term deal and was never going to activate the sponsorship, I think you can argue that in many ways that's not an ideal partner for a race like that, but that's what we got. We're in a situation now where GBR research, Great British Racing Research, has showed that for a lot of, blue, or for some blue chip, potential sponsors. Racing's links with betting and animal welfare questions are, make racing not that attractive to some sponsors. 
we're in a difficult financial environment, it's not going to be easy, is it, for the Jockey Club and then presumably ARC to find backers for those classics? No, it's, um, it's always very difficult and it always, for that reason, makes you kind of nervous when this discussion comes around, oh, we need a new sponsor for the Derby. It's a very expensive thing. Um, from the sports perspective, it also ought also to be a really attractive thing. Um, so the, the, you know, the danger is always that you find out that it's actually less attractive than you, you think it should be you know, to have your company's name attached to you know, the most prestigious flat race we have. It's, it's a really big deal. Um, but it's, it's such a personal thing. You know, we found in the past with some of the sponsors that we found, um, like uh, Vodafone and Investec, um, it, it depends to a very large extent on the personal enthusiasm of some senior executive within those companies. Which is why Investec ended, um, not to an extent anyway. Exactly, personnel change. But yeah. I mean, you know, they, they were around for the a relative long, long haul, 2009 to 2020. Um, so, I mean, I guess the, the uh, Tamiko uh, with the Cheltenham Gold Cup would be another yeah. example, I suppose. Um, so the loot will be out for, you know, for a company that's in that situation. Um, you, you know, it's just occurred to me sitting here listening to you that, um, you know, maybe the, the place where the jockey club suit should be pitching their hat is the, the, you know, the power companies. They're the ones who are <laughs> shortly at least going to have all the money. Apparently they're making bumper profits. And, yeah. um, you know, let's face it, they could do with improving their PR. So what better way than by, you know, supporting the nation's favourite flat race for three-year-olds? Um, well, uh, it, it would be nice to think that something can be wrapped up, you know, uh, by early in the new year because, of course, again, the great point with any sponsor for the Derby is you want to have a lead up to the race, yeah, don't you? You, you want would, to be yeah. in position well in advance so that you can benefit from the amount of money that you're spending. Well, in an ideal world, you want to be able to say now the horse that wins the Dewhurst or the Vatem Futurity will be going, going for, for the, the XX. The, the, the Aeon Epsom Derby. Derby. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's got a ring to it. It has got a ring to it. Scott, the, 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 when we look at big French races, um, am I wrong? There's often not a, a sponsor's name attached to, to all those races. Is it, is it a, a hot issue in France? I think there's, there's been uh, a sense of slight embarrassment that, say, for instance, a, a race like the British Jockey Club hasn't always had a sponsor, the French Derby. Um, but it's not something that makes an enormous difference on the balance sheet. I think uh, Qatar, obviously, of have invested enormously in the art festival uh, and have the, the prize money went up a lot when they they came on board uh, i think 2009 was their first first sponsorship um i think zakava was the the last of the old sponsorships the the you know the 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 two days is worth an astronomic figure and the, the arc itself is worth five million euros so they've made a big financial difference it doesn't tend to make so much of a difference here it's more of a uh, a cross-marketing thing. Uh, Longines, for instance, have sponsored the Prix de Diane for, for well over uh, 10 years now. And they obviously have links with lots of other equestrian sports and with with uh, fashion and, and obviously watches as well. That That's a good synergy because you can promote the race and promote the sort of the glamour of the occasion in, in other ways. Um, in terms of uh, a fit for the Derby, the ones that have worked the best, to my mind, are the ones where the sponsors have had other sponsorship outlets, uh, for instance, Investec were, were, were heavily involved in sponsoring uh, rugby and cricket as well. And I think anything like that, that, that can kind of bring in uh, fans of other sports, as opposed to somebody who's not interested in sport at all, I think you're already pushing at a slightly open door if you're looking at other sports fans. Um, so I think if they were to be able to interest uh, a sponsor that's already involved in, in other sporting areas, that would be interesting. Um, uh, if people's power energy bills are going to go up uh, in the way that uh, people are predicting, maybe we should have ever ready back because I think we'll all be running on batteries by by the, the new year. But. What, what is interesting is you look at some of the jurisdictions, and a bit like Scott was saying there, it doesn't make a huge difference to the balance sheet in France. I was in, uh, I went to Japan in 2019, and, and the JRA's um, senior figures were saying they actually don't chase sponsorship at all. That, a, they don't need it, but they'll say if you rely on a sponsor, and that sponsor disappears, what do you do? Yeah. Um, it was interesting at the um, Horse Racing Industry Conference quite recently, they put up some figures on the board, didn't they? But the percentage of the sports income that comes from each particular area, sponsorship was maybe less than I expected. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps we have to be careful about um, the importance that we attach to these things. Um, but it, it does feel it's like it's almost a, 
like a, a referendum on our significance, you know, in the wider world, um, can we atta att attract a blue chip sponsor for our biggest race, you know, and th that's, I think, why people get nervous when a bookmaker attaches their name yeah. to another major race, you know, they, they want to know there's people out there who are going, oh, yes, I'd love to get involved in one of Horse Racing's biggest events. I think that's right. And although I think it is the case that this partnership ending isn't a reflection in itself on racing and the derby, what will be a reflection on racing and the derby is who comes next, the identity of the next sponsor, um, because that will be key, I think, to sending out that message as to uh, the derby's uh, hold on the public's attention now and in the future. Right, two stories down, one more to go. Chris Cook, you spent a significant chunk of your week watching a BHA appeal hearing. Yeah, happy days. Happy days. It was uh, six hours of hearing um, cool. last Wednesday. Uh, this was the very, very belated um, Norfolk Stakes appeal. Um, the um, Kia Jirabjian, who owns the second and the third from that race, um, was basically appealing against the, the fact that the stewards chose not to demote or disqualify the Riddler, who, you know, memorably veered across the track in the closing stages and, and got in the way of... A few horses, uh, there were two in particular that he interfered with that, that was the subject of discussion last week. So um, Rory McNeese was appearing, um, a solicitor who's always in these cases, um, usually for jockeys on yeah. this occasion, appearing on behalf of, uh, of the owner of the second and third, um, saying, um, well, either the BHA, either the stewards on the day um, should have disqualified the Riddler because it, it, what happened amounted to dangerous riding, um, or they should have taken the view that... Um, uh, the interference with Crispy Cat affected the outcome. Crispy Cat would have won with a clear yeah. run, therefore demote the Riddler behind yeah. Crispy Cat, which would have the happy outcome of leaving Kia's other horse in first place. Um, we still don't know the outcome, quite unusually, um, because they got to 4.45, um, and we, that was when all the evidence was finished. And you can sort of understand why, um, after the amount of evidence they'd heard, a panel would go we're not going to tell you right away what we think. We're going to go away and digest this and think about it and come up with a verdict next week. So uh, sometime this week, I think, is when we'll hear it might actually be next week. I suppose, given that we've waited for two months just to get to the hearing, you know, we can, we can all be a bit more patient. But it, it does feel to me as though a, a delay of this nature is excessive. I wish we had a system in place that um, could have arranged this to happen a bit earlier. You know, we're, we're bumping into sales season and there's all sorts of implications that sort of hinge on, to some extent, um, the identity of the Norfolk Stakes winner. Um, people would like to know, you know, um, what's actually going to appear in the, the history books relating to that race. Um, uh, again, uh, we're always talking about our interference rules and whether they're appropriate and whether there's a sufficient deterrent um, for jockeys, you know, allowing their horses to veer across the track like this. Paul Hannigan says, um, you know, that he, he sort of he didn't realise quite how far the horse had moved. He, he talked about the width of the Ascot track, you know, and, and of course that race, the field did go out the middle of the track. They weren't next to a rail. So he says, you, you lose your bearings to some extent. He hadn't realised quite how far the horse had moved. He thought he was clear anyway to begin with. The only thing he says he regrets with the benefit of hindsight is um, he used the stick three times in his right hand. He, say, he says he regrets the final one of the three, um, which led to more or less immediate contact with James Doyle's horse. Um, and he said if he could have his time again, he wouldn't do that. And the interference that he caused, the total interference, wouldn't quite be as bad. Um, I, I think I would like to think that eventually we can get ourselves to a, a happier position in terms of our interference rules where jockeys are yeah. just taking a bit more care to keep their horses straight, to look after each other. That being said, James Doyle did turn up in the hearing and said he never thought it was dangerous riding. You know, it was not one of those situations where after crossing the line he was looking for the other jockey and going up to them and wagging his finger and saying, don't do that again. Um, he, he didn't uh, say anything and I, actually he said that Paul came to him sort of voluntarily after looking at replay and saying look I'm sorry about that I didn't realise that was quite as bad as, mm -hmm. as it's turned out to be one would think with the rules being written the way they are uh, this is not a result that's going to change um, but they you know they put up a, a proper good argument over six hours um, they made their case and, and hopefully um, at the end of it all they'll have the satisfaction of at least having been heard in full um, again, I, I think it's taken us too long to get to this point, and I, I didn't really feel there was a need for it to go to drag on quite as long as it did. Um, you know, I think 
a, a differently minded chairman could have moved things along and, and got it completed in maybe four and a half hours, say. Even, I mean, there's, there's nothing particularly complex about this race. For all that the interference was dramatic, you know, we've all seen races like it. I think you could probably cover all of the relevant issues and get through all the witnesses you want to have in a, in a much shorter time than, than six hours. We only had two witnesses for crying out loud. Yeah. Scott, were you, were you surprised it's taken, are you surprised it's taken so long? And are you troubled that it's taken to, uh, so long? Uh, I think it's a slight anomaly uh, that it's taken this long, uh, really. I'm, I'm not entirely sure that that's a, a reflection on the system. I think if, if individuals were unavailable for whatever reason, uh, we may never know the reasons behind what the delay was. But I don't think it's a, it's a bloated system that takes too long to, to, to get to a conclusion. Um, I think I'd be more concerned about uh, the nature of the rules where the stewards didn't feel they could take more severe action. Obviously, they, they handed Paul a, a pretty hefty ban, but um, the way that the, the British rules are written makes it very, very difficult to change the result when the horse wins by that cl much clear margin and uh, the the bar to clear for, for dangerous riding is so high. Um, I've, I've said this in Britain. I, I wrote a, a column a couple of weeks ago. I think there is a definite case for a an extra category of interference, which would be kind of negligent riding, if you like, which would be above careless, but below dangerous, and would give uh, give the stewards the option of changing the result. Not necessarily, because at the moment, if it's dangerous riding, they have to change the result, which is why they never reach for dangerous. Um, and in the situation of careless riding, it has to satisfy very, very strict criteria uh, for them to change the result. I think a more flexible, negligent, uh, riding would have given them the opportunity. They wouldn't necessarily have come down on the decision that they would and it requires more discretion and then you get into the whole situation of people saying, well, you know, it's, you need, we, we need to know exactly where we are. We need, we need stability in this. Maybe this provides less, less clarity and stability, but I just think that, that, you know, good professional stewards would have looked at that and said that ride fell a long way below what is expected of a top professional in one of our showcase meetings, and they should have at least had the opportunity to change the result. Um, one other interesting aspect I found of this case was that Rory McNeese um, produced some actual data, which never happens in these hearings, um, collected by total performance data from the, the Norfolk Stakes, um, which showed in miles per hour um, the impact on Crispy Cat's speed of having the other horse come across right in front of him. Um, and, you know, the, so the, there was a very interesting little graph um, showing the sort of uh, fluctuation in velocity of Crispy Cat versus um, the Riddler. Uh, the Riddler speed is basically in decline for the last furlong. Um, Crispy Cat, as they enter the last furlong, is going faster than the eventual winner, and he even manages to quicken with about half a furlong to go um, before the impact of the interference comes. Um, so yeah, it was very interesting to see that, and that actually um, uh, suggested to me that the uh, the interference was more severe than I had thought just from looking at the, the replay. Um, talking to someone at Total Performance Data, they were saying, we can actually um, come up with an average figure for the rate at which uh, horses are losing their speed in the closing stages at Ascot over various distances. You know, it, it, it should be possible at some stage in the future to actually come up with a bit of software that can predict the finishing time for a horse, you know, once you've got its first four furlongs in a five furlong race, um, uh, if it's been interfered with, you can actually um, come up with some calculation to tell you um, the time it would have achieved without the interference, and then you can compare that with the actual winner and say, well, would this horse have won with a clear run? Um, you don't have to rely on the impressionistic judgment of stewards anymore. Um, you know, there'll just be a computer that'll tell you um, at the press of a button. So, I mean, th that, that to me is interesting to have that kind of objective standard, um, which, as I say, will be informed by millions of bits of data because TPD have been collecting data from, from finishes at Ascot for years now. Um, I, I find that quite an alluring way forward. And just very quickly then, just to confirm, you think the Riddler will keep the Norfolk States? Yeah, I think so, yeah. That's what Chris thinks. We'll find out what the panel thinks, hopefully, quite soon. So very quickly then, before we sign off from this week's show, given we have got our French correspondent Scott Burton with us today, and given that yesterday William Haggis came out with a statement in which he said there is now a strong chance that Bayid 
will run in the arc. Hurrah! Uh, so long as the ground is deemed suitable. I think by that, we, we're, we're saying that if the ground is, is, is soft, arduous, but he won't run in the arc. If it's decent ground, he will run in the arc. Um, Scott, we wanted to ask you, um, not simply what the reaction to that has been in France, but looking at what the ground has been at Longshore over previous arcs, over a period of time, how hopeful should we be, do you think, that we'll actually see Bayid in the pre de Triumph? I think anybody who's uh, only started following racing in the last three years might assume that it's always a swamp at, at Longchamp, but actually it's a flip of a coin. It's 50-50. If you look back over the last 20 years, 11 arcs have been on good soft or good ground. Nine have been on soft, very soft holding or heavy. Uh, in the last 10 years, it's 6-4 in, in, in favour of, of, of easier conditions. Um, I will say William Haggis walked the track, uh, the, the ground officially in 2018 when Sea of Class ran and she definitely wanted uh, top of the ground. The ground was officially good that day. It was 3.2 on the on the penetrometer, but we had quite a heavy shower uh, just kind of over lunchtime. And he was out in his sou'wester with his umbrella prodding and poking at it. Um, and that's where they hatched the plan for, for James Doyle to stay on the rail, to, to drop back from the wide draw and, and go around the rail because that's where the best ground was. I do think that um, he will give it every chance. If they if they decide to supplement on the Wednesday, I'm sure he'll give it every chance. And the, the last thing to bear in mind is that uh, the, the translations between the French penetrometer readings and what we would consider like the turf tracks, the going stick readings are not exact. So if, if the French going is given as bon souple, which would translate as good to soft, that's probably near a good ground, maybe even with a bit of good to firm in it. So I don't think he's going to be swayed just by by what the predictions are on the on a penetrometer i think if they get to the stage where on the wednesday before the arc uh they haven't had substantial rain and i can't remember the last time it rained here um then i think they'll pay the supplementary and i think you'll go and walk it and look at the way it rides on saturday and i think you'll give by every chance to run and scott the reaction in 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 france among french racing circles within within france Gallo must have been incredibly enthusiastic when they heard what william haggis said yesterday yeah, absolutely. I mean, I rather uh, diligently didn't speak to anybody who's got a, a fancied runner in the race because they may have a, a very different view. But no, very generally speaking, I spoke to Olivier Pellier and also the, the chief executive of France Gallo, uh, Olivier Deloire as well. And the, the reaction is overwhelmingly positive. Um, they're very proud of the fact that um, uh, for three of the last five years, the ARC has been voted the world's best race on ratings. And I think, assuming Baye turns up, and he finishes in the top four, it'll happen again this year. It's, it's a bit of a coin flip, isn't it? Um, they're bound to be very nervous about what the weather's going to do, what the ground is going to be like. Um, as I remember it, you know, it's not just the rainfall that we typically get uh, in Paris at that time of year. There's, you, know, you get the heavy dews as well um, that just seem to keep that, that track naturally with you know a little bit damp in the week of the race. Um, this is going to be Bide's first and only race at a mile and a half, um, and they won't want that to happen on ground that's got, you know, cut in it um, so any rainfall at all is going to make them very nervous um, I would think he's going to be supplemented isn't he on the Wednesday um, assuming and, the ground looks like it's potentially favourable uh, you can easily imagine circumstances which they supplement him and then have a very nervous two or three days hoping that the rain doesn't actually turn up um, so we'll see they're bound to leave it as late as they can and then they've got the champion stakes two weeks later as, yeah. the, as the fallback I think so yeah it would be very interesting to see um, yeah, it's going to make the arc, isn't it? And it's going to become the story oh, of the arc, yeah, even yeah. in the week of. Absolutely. I mean, I know I've said this before, but I am cock a hoop with excitement that William Haggis is now appearing, and particularly Shaker Hissa, therefore, is leaning towards the arc. I say he's the world's best racehorse. It's the best race in the world. In that sense, they are a natural fit. It would be a very risky move to sit at home with Biden's box if the arc was run on good ground and then find the champion section is run on heavy ground two weeks later. I mean, up, um, to, up to a point, you could always skip the champion stakes at that point. Well, and, you could, but then you, you'd miss... Retire unbeaten. Um, you, you, yeah, you, you could. But we want to see Bayed once more. I think most racing fans would long to see him in the arc. I think many of the connections of Bayed would long to see him in the arc as well. I think it's great that they're moving in sure. that direction. And I don't think it is any reflection on the champion stakes. It is a great race, it's a fantastic race, I but agree. the arc towers over all other, I think, all aged uh, championship flat races. It is the arc, and I would long to see 
bodied in it, and um, I think it, I think it seems like it might happen now. And hopefully, there's lots of people with ten furlong horses out there just now, sort of thinking about the champion stakes. You know, that if by doesn't show up there, then that can be a really competitive contest. You know, much more so than if he was there and starting at threes on. Um, so I, I'm I'm kind of nervous for Bayed's connections, though, in a way, in a, in a weird way. I mean, you know, they they, won't, they don't need my support, but. Um, it's, uh, it's much more of a swashbuckling thing to do than we're used to with these top horses. I mean, five minutes ago, this horse was a pure miler, and now you might be going to Paris over a mile and a half, you know, and good to solve. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's not usual. It's not, but what an amazing record that horse would have this year. He went from the Lockinge and the Queen and the Sussex to winning a pre like the Triumph. And well done as well to Connections, because they could have just been stubborn and said, no, we've said the Champions League, we stick to it. They've actually, they've right. rethought it through, and I think that is greatly to their credit. We await their decision. Um, a decision on which is the front page winning story will come much quicker now and it won't come as a great surprise. Um, Chris's story about the Norfolk Stakes, I almost want to give it to you just because you had to sit through a six hour <laughs> appeal hearing, but you waited so long for your first victory which came last week, it would seem wrong to give you back to Fair back enough. victory a, because a it hearing would is expectations. A hearing is its own reward. Yeah. Absolutely. And my own story about the Derby, um, I think that is a, a, a powerful story, but it's almost, I think, more important what happens next in terms of who the Jockey Club can find as the next uh, sponsor of yeah. the Derby, given I think we're agreed that the loss of Kazoo is not a reflection on the Derby in itself. And therefore, Scott, on your debut on this show, and having been so, uh, so erudite in your analysis of the fixture list situation, you, sir, are the winner. Well, how marvellous to know that uh, hands across the English Channel and the jury is not out. Indeed, it is not. Victory then for Scott Burton. Thanks to Scott. Thanks to Chris Cook. Thanks to you for watching. We'll be back next week looking at some more big racing stories on the front page. Until then, bye-bye. <laughs>